Welcome. I'm Jim Connolly. I'll be your platform guy for today. And now our opening song led by Leanne Atherton. And you know, we talk, we want to talk about how we're going to keep prayer with us. Well, let's see what this song could tell us and help us there. Let me remember how it goes. It's kind of a <laughs> reggae beat. When you pray, move your feet. You can do that. Bring his love to the people we meet. Get up out your chair, walk the street. Almost. <laughs> when you pray, move your feet. Thank you. That was so fun. What a, what a great song. Isn't that great? And very appropriate for this morning. Oh, because, good. <laughs> well, we'll be talking about how do you pray the rest of the day? You know, many, many people are really good at doing their, you know, morning meditation, or for me, it's usually later in the evening before going to bed. But, you know, you get in that perfect space, you've got your little meditation spot in your house, and maybe a little altar, and it's all quiet, and you have that delightful, beautiful prayer. And then you just go into your day, at least for me, for decades, I would just charge into the day and be busy, busy, busy doing my thing. And it wasn't until that night when I'm lying on the couch in our bedroom, sort of reading some inspirational book. Because you know what? I never once the whole day thought about God, prayed about anything. I just sort of relied on my own like human brain. I'm an engineer. So, you know, just working on my tasks, solving a problem. And so it's very easy. Morning. It's very easy to just sort of fall into the busyness of the day. And so what, what I'd like to talk about today is how do we maintain that connection to spirit? How do we stay plugged in or communing with God and, and really turn every moment into a prayer? And so uh, I'd like to sh I'll share four examples, uh, two of my own and two from others. And uh, at least for me, it, it drives home that point of just sort of not only constantly being in a state of asking for guidance and direction from God, Holy Spirit, Jesus, higher self, guardian angels, asking, but then also we'll talk a bit about what does it mean to ask and then to listen? Because <laughs> uh, if all we're doing is just sort of broadcasting and we, we never <laughs> get quiet to listen, uh, we don't hear the answer. So we'll talk a little bit about that too. So this was some, some years back. I was looking for something in the house. I, I, I needed it like the next weekend. And so I, I thought it was in a box somewhere. We packed it away in a closet. So I spent a couple hours scouring the entire house. I pulled off every box from every shelf in every bedroom. <laughs> I finally gave up on that. I went in the laundry room, the, you know, the kitchen, I like places there's no way this thing would ever be. I don't even remember what the item was. But <laughs> no, there was no way it would be in the kitchen. I'm out in the garage. I'm just pulling boxes down. I mean, I know this thing exists somewhere in our house. And so <laughs> after a couple hours, I gave up. And so then the next day, the whole thing repeats itself. I'm running around and I'm just looking for, through everything. I'm looking through every box. And then at this point, to be honest, I'm getting a little frustrated. It's a little bit like, you know, why can't I find this? Oh, and, you know, getting upset that I can't find this thing. And so I was not at a place of peace. So, <laughs> again, that was, I, it felt like a couple hours. Maybe it wasn't, but it felt like a couple hours. So I finally just sort of gave up. You know, it was a really a feeling of giving up. But I wasn't, it wasn't giving up and now I'm at peace. It was like, damn it, you know, I'm really, <laughs> I can't find this thing, you know, and so giving up. But, so then I, I gave it a rest for a couple of days. So then again, sometime in the middle of the week, I'm like, I really need this thing for next weekend. So I start the whole process again and I start walking around and I, I still remember this clear as a bell. I was in the game room and I don't remember exactly what I said, but it's probably something like this, just that, ah, oh, God, I know it's right for me to find this. I know that I am connected with the source of infinite intelligence and all ideas. Everything is in its right place. And I ask that you guide and direct me to find this. And just boom, in an instant, it's just like this thing flashed in my head. I just went, went straight to the corner bedroom. I reached up on the shelf in the closet. I pulled the box down. I opened it up and there it was. <laughs> and I swear, I, I, I opened that box five times, it felt like. You know, so... It was just, the reason this has been stuck with me as such an important lesson is the contrast between doing it all by myself, you know, hours of just frantic searching, trying, 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 trying. And then when I finally asked, because that whole time, that, that those first those previous two days, 
it didn't occur to me to even ask, you know, for anything beyond just the sheer effort of looking for it. And the moment I just got quiet and asked for guidance and affirmed that everything is in its order, you know, it's the right place I can find it's just bam, it was there. And so ever since then, you know, it's been very clear to me that, you know, doing it all by yourself and all alone through sheer effort, you know, it's just, it's exhausting. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, you know, but uh, ask for guidance and direction can really uh, make a difference. Okay, so that's, that's the first one. Uh, Oh, you know, it's, it's funny that sometimes we feel like, well, you know, I don't really want to pester God with like the little stuff, you know, <laughs> you know maybe I should like, you know, save it up for like when, you know, there's a real crisis, then you know, I really want to ask. But, you know, what I've realized is that one, first of all, you know, God has no limitations. It's not like God has put down his work, you know, get interrupted, you know, and, and, and then tend to our needy. Our, tend to our needs and then you know in a huff and a puff you know go back to you know what he was doing before he got interrupted by us if god had a human personality she'd be more like a grandmother who just like loves all the little squeals of her grandchildren running all over <laughs> and making noise and it's music to her ears it's not irritating and so in the same way wouldn't god just be delighted if every day throughout the day we were reaching out desiring that connection asking for you know guidance, direction, comfort, a little pat on the head, whatever it is. <laughs> so that, that's what God would be like. So go ahead, you know, test for God all you want. At least that's what I'm doing. I'm, I'm <laughs> even before, you know, before I leave the house in the morning now, you know, it, or before I leave on anything, you know, do I have everything? Holy Spirit, is there anything that I'm forgetting? You know, I did that this morning as I left, you know, and so, so that, that's, that's one thing that's be becoming clear to me. Now, here's another one, uh, talks about the importance of asking. So this is a delightful book by Jan Frazier, When Fear Falls Away. And oh, this book is just like, it's just like feeds the soul. It's one of those, you only want to read a couple pages a night because you don't want to blow through it. You want to like savor it, make it last. So she, uh, she tells a story of this endless series of um, mammograms and then, you know, biopsies and pathology reports and false positives and just, this went on for years. And so she just, she describes it in, in her book like this. I'll just read a few paragraphs. She says, three breast cancer scares came to me when I was, at, I was in my late thirties and early forties. During each of those episodes, anxiety took me in its teeth and held tight. The grip of fear started with the mammogram itself, intensifying with the phone call saying that I needed a biopsy. And it did not let go until the second phone call reporting a benign pathology. The days between those two phone calls were an unremitting nightmare of waiting for the phone to ring, not wanting to answer it when it did. And once it was six weeks worth of days. How I managed to sleep at all, I do not know. I was crippled by fear, beaten and maddened by it. Hour after hour, day after day, I felt on the verge of a panic attack. And the threat of that brought about its own particular terror because she had had panic attacks earlier in her life. So she goes on and says that, you know, year after year, I made the trip across the state and down, down the hall. It never got any, any easier, not even after several consecutive years of the radiologist saying that everything looked fine. Each time the doctor said all was well, I almost collapsed with the release of all that anxious tension. I was paying a terrible price to be so afraid. And then she starts with sort of the moment that things changed and it's, it's in the form of a diary. And she's a writer, it's just, it's just like poetry, it's beautiful, um, the way that she shares things. But she shares this from her diary. She says, something happened today that I never would have thought possible. I went for my mammogram and I wasn't terrified. Really, the significant thing came last night. I was lying in bed thinking ahead to today, dreading the trip to Jamaica Plain, anticipating the hyperventilating in the waiting room, the hideous anxiety. I was lying there thinking about all of this when all of a sudden I had this thought to say a little prayer, to ask for help. I said, could I maybe do this tomorrow without being terrified? That was her prayer. Could I maybe do this tomorrow without being terrified? <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> but it was heartfelt and it was sincere. She says, who was I asking? I don't really know. 
But the moment I had that thought, I felt something happen, like something physical was lifted off of me. I felt dancing around my head as if somebody were whirling around me in circles, clapping hands, laughing, rejoicing. <laughs> I sat up and I knew, I just knew that it would come true. I would have my mammogram without fear. I didn't know how I could be so sure. It was weird, especially given my history, but there was no doubt in my mind. And so then just a little bit more, she says, I, I really was not afraid today. I couldn't get over it. After the films were taken and then the waiting began, I watched myself sit comfortably in the waiting room, reading my magazine, paying attention to what it said instead of how it always was in the past, looking at the pages, but not really seeing them. Each time the nurse came to the doorway with a clipboard to call some woman's name, which was her turn to take the walk down the hall to the radiologist's office, I watched my heart not crawl up my throat. Hmm. So she was in this, she was just all that fear had just fallen away. And then just a couple pages later, she reflects on what happened that night that she said that little prayer. She says the, the dancing I felt around my head it was like somebody twirling, rejoicing, saying, finally, she asked. <laughs> so it was like there were legions of angels <laughs> just waiting. And she's like, could I maybe do this tomorrow without being terrified? And they're like, good enough. You know, <laughs> it was an invitation. You know? and, and isn't it like that all the time? If we're just willing to ask, we have this free will. We can push God away as long as we want. We can do it on our own. But th th there's just legions of angels just waiting to help us. And as soon as we make that, that little tiny request, it's just like a vacuum, just like, you know, infinite presence just rushes in to fill that. So, uh, and, and this was for her, it, was, it wasn't just that uh, mammogram. Like all fear fell away in her entire life. It took her months to ad adjust to this hmm. because she still had the same house, kids, husband, dog, job, every, nothing had changed on the outer, but nothing bothered her anymore. She was just completely at peace. And, and she actually was just like, she was in a state of bliss, but she, then she had to adjust to how to function in the world without getting wound up by everything. Mm -hmm. And then she said she was actually able to be more helpful. Like her daughter had a little crisis and before she would have flown off the handle and sort of joined in with, with railing against her ex-husband. Instead, she said, I was able to truly be helpful because I was able to be with her without, you know, sort of getting wound up in the drama. So I highly recommend this, Jan Frazier, When Fear Falls Away. But I think it's important for us to ask ourselves, what areas of our lives are we just sort of doing all by ourselves? And we never ask for help. We never, it never occurs to us that we could actually seek divine guidance on this topic. For me, it was just decades of just doing my engineering thing. You know, you go to work, you're an engineer, you do stuff, you know, you solve problems. You know, what does God have to do with any of that? You know, but as the, as the time went by, I started to sort of realize that, you know, the source of divine intelligence and wisdom is present for us in any circumstance. And so the last story I'll tell will, will be sort of how I started to apply that at first. But I think it's good for us to ask ourselves, is there something in your life right now, maybe you can think about that for the rest of the talk, that you're sort of stuck on? And have we even asked? I mean, for me, it was just like three days of looking for something. For Jan Frazier, it was years and years of this annual mammogram. We probably have some area of our life where we just sort of somehow think it's like off limits to God or isn't necessary or we shouldn't bother God with it. So uh, just encourage you to think about that a little bit. Um, and then there's this other important thing, you know, concept that of Course in Miracles and it refers to it as a little willingness. And it's, it's just, that, that's the invitation. You know, you just have to, to ask, just to make that request, to have that intention. And then there's another beautiful quote. It says, the Holy Spirit's voice is as loud as your willingness to listen. <laughs> So we can ask, but if we're like, you shout out your request, la, 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 I can't hear you, I can't hear you, if we're not quiet to listen for that answer, you know, it's just, uh, we just rush about our day, and it was sort of like a fake request, you know, you make the request, I'm just kidding, you know, <laughs> I'm on my way. So, so I've been also trying to remember that the Holy Spirit's voice is as loud as your willingness to listen and, and, and do the listening part. And it doesn't have to be a long drawn out. It's just that intention. It's just that 
an attention to ask and then it's intention to receive and listen and hear. And so what works for me is just uh, just this practice, making it a habit to ask for help. You know, what should I make for dinner tonight? You know, when I'm going somewhere, is there anything else that I should bring with me? Or walking into a meeting or a conversation, just having that intent that I go forth into that activity, you know, with, with God's guidance. Right? <clears throat> and we can, we can also foster this kind of attitude with regular gratitude practices, maybe a gratitude journal, um, affirming the truths that we know. Maybe we have some affirmations that we like. I, you know, I, I print out little pieces of paper and scatter them about the house. Um, and, and also I found that when we're willing to be of service, when we're in, in, in an act of service, we get out of our sort of me, me, me type mentality and we're serving others and we, we get into that flow of giving and receiving. We sort of unconsciously then give ourselves permission to receive. So it's, it's like, well, I know that I'm in this flow. You know, it technically is not necessary. Like you don't have to go serve in order to be in a state of receivership. You know, we can always be in a state of receivership because, you know, God has infinite resources with which to bless us. But at least while we're still working through our human ego stuff, being of service and intentionally engaging in those activities of service somehow helps get us in that flow. At least that's what I think. So um, one other thing that, that I think is important is to... Now, So one of the things that, that I'm talking about asking for help as if it's outside of us, you know, and so for me, it, it makes sense to pray to God, Holy Spirit, Jesus, higher self, doesn't matter what term you use. But for me, that works, even though I know that ultimately that source of all knowledge and wisdom and intelligence sort of dwells within us and bubbles up from within us. So it's just good to start thinking about that as, you know, I'm not like this needy little toddler begging mom for something. You know, it's, it's more of a, at least for me, asking the Holy Spirit to help works for me, but I'm starting to realize that that dwells within me, that there's, it, it's not far away. It's just, it, it's closer than a breath, you know, it's just right there. So that's just a fun idea to play with. So uh, another one, another great example that I get home for me uh, is from this book, Absence from Felicity by Ken Wapnick. Uh, and he helped to get A Course in Miracles published. So he came along after Helen Shuckman had sort of received this through The Voice, uh, and she and her colleague Bill Thetford had written it all down. He helped to get the thing whipped into shape for publication. So he wrote this book uh, after she had passed away and sort of a long history of, of her life and, and Bill as well, and then also talking about Talking about this experience she had, which, which I took the book, I took the bookmark out. I will find, I will find this quick enough because I. Holy Spirit, I Holy Spirit will show me what this is, and it's a, it's a great one. So he's describing. So, so she had a bunch of notes in her notebooks. He inherited all of her notebook, notebooks after she passed away, and so there was, you know, not only all of the stuff that turned into a course in miracles, but a bunch, bunch of personal notes, you know. So. She, she referred to this voice as the voice with a capital B, you know, so basically she was receiving these spiritual ideas. Um, it's sort of ironic. She was a professor of psychology at Columbia University in New York City, a prestigious university, and she's hearing a voice in her head. Wow. Of course, she didn't tell her colleagues that, <laughs> except just that one, Bill, her boss. So, so this was a story about her. She was looking for a jacket, um, you know, some kind of coat, uh, New York City. And this is what the voice says to her. It says, the reason I direct everything that is unimportant is because it is no way to waste your free will. Hmm. If you insist on doing the trivial your way, you waste too much time and will on it. Will cannot be free if it is tied up in trivia. It never gets out. I will tell you exactly what to do in connection with everything that does not matter. That is not an area where choice should be invested there is better use of time. You have to remember to ask me to take charge of all minutia, and they will be taken care of so well and so quickly that you cannot bog down in it. And here's the punchline. It says, the only remaining problem is that you will be unwilling to ask because you are afraid not to be bogged down. 
wow, I mean, that hit home for me is like, we're so caught up in our busyness and our frantic rush and even our productive pursuits. We're doing good things, important things, you know? And so we're doing all this stuff, but we're so caught up <laughs> that we're just filling our time with the minutia. So let me read that one more time. You have to remember to ask me to take charge of all minutia and they will be taken care of so well and so quickly that you cannot bog down in it. The only remaining problem is that you will be unwilling to ask because you are afraid not to be bogged down. So that hit home for me. Is anybody else frantically busy yeah. and just <laughs> doing your <laughs> so I've been like resting in between tasks. Yeah. And I feel guilty. Oh <laughs> guilty for taking a break between tasks. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's crazy what we've created for ourselves. But we also have that choice to just sort of pause and mm -hmm. recognize that I'm burdening myself with my new shit and then ask that that goes so smoothly and so well that Holy Spirit, what would you have me do? Where would you have me go? What would you have me say and to whom? And then we can truly be a blessing to others. So it continues a little bit here and says, you know, uh, about, it continues, do not let this hold us back. If you will ask, and that's the key point, if you will ask, I can arrange these things even if you are not too enthusiastic. <laughs> that, that, that's where all you need is just, just a little willingness. Just, just give me something to work with here, you know? <laughs> <laughs> And it says, uh, prayer can be very specific in little matters. If you need a coat, ask me where to find one. I know your taste well. <laughs> and I also know where the coat is that you would eventually buy anyway. So, so then Ken goes on and he describes that, you know, not only did Helen find exactly the coat she wanted, but the salesman who waited on her needed Helen's help very badly. He had a retarded child and was at a loss for what to do. And Helen was able to be extremely helpful with him. And so it wasn't about the coat. It was really about, yeah, she was going to get her coat at the right time in the right place, but she was able to be a blessing to that salesman. You know, and, and she had an expertise in childhood psychology, basically childhood disorders. And so somehow she was able to be helpful to that salesman and you know, that salesman's child. And so that's the idea of just if, if we're asking for guidance and direction, now we've taken it out of that task oriented, I'm gonna go buy a coat, need to go get this done, check it off my list, get in, get out. You know, instead she was guided to be there at just the right time, just the right place and be of service to someone else. And then uh, the voice continues, it's a, it's a little comical. So he says, uh, I cannot save you more time than you will let me, but if you are willing to try the higher shopping service, and higher shopping service is capitalized like a proper noun, if you are willing to try the higher shopping service, which also covers all lower order necessities and even quite a number of whims within reason, <laughs> I have very good use for the time we could save. <laughs> yeah. And it's also ironic that Helen Shuckman, she reluctantly went along with this like seven year process of receiving the course and then transcribing it. She knew it was her thing to do, yet she sort of pushed back and fought at it a little bit. So it was an interesting, she was the perfect um, object lesson of that, how our ego runs out of control sometimes, and then our connection to God and the Holy Spirit. And so she was like an object lesson of, of delivering the book that was meant to help people, you know, through that process. So that was a delightful reminder to me. Um, so, so we're all like, you know, of course I want to be in that present that state of mind. You know, why would I not? You know, and so what I've, what I've done is to sort of foster that is I just use a bunch of little techniques. You know, as I mentioned, I print out little prayers and pieces of paper, scatter them in the car, in the bathroom, and on the coffee table, you know, to memorize some stuff or, or get those affirmations. Or I'll have a, a daily app, you know, for my Course in Miracles lesson, or you can get the daily email of, like chicken soup for the soul or notes from the universe or the daily word, the electronic version of that, you get that every day. And I don't try to like consume all of that first thing in the morning, you know, I sort of spread it out through the day. Hmm. So now I'm getting constant reminders throughout the day. And when I'm checking my email, okay, I'll read one of those, you know, or uh, if you can, might as well put my phone to good use, you know, and so several times a day, I'll go back and look at my lesson, the Course in Miracles lesson for the day and just sort of keep on reminding myself of that. And so uh, the real goal is to just establish this kind of communing with God habit, 
and I don't know about you all, but when I go out and work in my garden, I, I, I just talk to all my plants. I'm just, we're having a great conversation, even though they're not saying much, but <laughs> I'm just talking to my plants. Some of you may talk to your pets, but really, I mean, nobody, as long as nobody's listening, you know, we can, <laughs> we, can, we can talk to God all day long. And it's that, it's like that touchstone. It's like just coming back and remembering that I'm not a struggling human being trying to do it all alone. There's a source, an ever-present source of help. So, uh, one thing that has worked for me is to memorize some long prayers. Uh, and so, you know, I'd work, it took me months, you know, for, for each one, but, you know, I would sort of memorize this prayer and then I would say it over and over again. And then eventually it becomes so ingrained in your mind that even when you wake up, you're just sort of like half awake, half asleep. And you just sort of like say that in your mind. Mm -hmm. And there's one that I've enjoyed from A Course in Miracles and it, and it goes like this. I am here only to be truly helpful. I am here to represent him who sent me. I do not have to worry about what to say or what to do because he who sent me will direct me. I am content to be wherever he wishes, knowing he goes there with me. I will be healed as I let him teach me to heal. Mm -hmm. So it's this willingness to go out into the day, into the world and just be an instrument of healing. And so whenever I go into a, like a, a meeting or, you know, go into some kind of situation where I'm a little bit nervous, you know, I'll say that. And so uh, I was at work several years ago and uh, the guy who sits right across from me, his name's Jim. So Jim says, hey, Neil, can you look at something with me? I've been just looking at this for like three days now. I've tried everything, you know, I've, I've tried this and that, and, you know, he's debugging it, trying to find the problem. And he said, I'm just stuck. I, you know, could you just, I just need another set of eyeballs to look at this with me. So in the 10 seconds it took me to just get out of my cube and walk over to his cube, I just started that prayer. I am here only to be truly healthy. And just that first line, it brings back to me the whole prayer, because I've said it so many times, because it's sort of ingrained in my consciousness. But it was a willingness as I walked over to his cube to sort of ask spirit for guidance and direction instead of just doing it all by my engineering meal cell. <laughs> and so, so we, we, you know, we sit down and he shows me what the problem is, shows the symptom. We looked at a few, uh, had a few ideas, we looked through some files. I started to get an idea of what it might be. We kept on digging a little bit. And in less than five minutes, we found the problem. It was a single line of code, like a simple fix. We changed it, recompiled, ran the test again. Perfect, it ran perfectly. And he was delighted because he had just spent three days working on this one problem. And I was delighted. Of course, I was happy that I was able to help him, but I was more delighted that I had remembered to ask for guidance, to just call upon some higher wisdom. And maybe we would have figured it out anyways. Maybe we would have struggled for another three days. I don't know. But uh, I'm starting to, to notice that just that little act of asking, you know, is very powerful. So in summary, you know, if you notice the common theme running through every one of these examples was just a simple but crucial act of asking. In every case, you know, I asked for help finding that thing. And then Jan Frazier asked, could we maybe do this without you know, all that suffering and, and, and struggle? And then, you know, the, the Helen Schuckman example of, you know, if you'll ask me, I'll take care of all of my minutia for you. And so uh, we have to constantly be asking and then um, that's when clarity comes because we can confuse ourselves when we're just sort of running around and thinking by ourselves and doing it all on our own. And so that regular return to prayer consciousness through something throughout your day, just find ways to constantly come back instead of get to the end of the day and realize, man, that was exhausting. I did that all by myself. And so I'd encourage you all in the week ahead to just sort of think about that. You know, what, what areas of my life am I considering separate? And this is actually the, the conversation cafe afterward. You know, are there areas of your life that you somehow just didn't think you could actually pray about or didn't occur to you? Or maybe you did have that moment of, of clarity and you did ask and something came or on the contrary, you're like, no, I, 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 I spent years doing it all by myself. You know, so give example, I just love to hear examples from people about the cases where you're realizing you've been doing it all by yourself or you asked for help and it came. And so when you get home today, I encourage you to just take some kind of action, something that will give you that regular daily, every moment of prayer consciousness. And uh, so 
along these lines, a, a nice clo closing quote, a, a good friend of mine, Chuck Robinson, um, once got to meet Gopi Krishna, a, a famous Indian spiritual teacher. And he did a photography session with him. And so and when the photography session was over, he asked Gopi Krishna, basically he asked, what's the key to enlightenment? You know, some version of that question. And Gopi Krishna looked at him and said, every day, as often as you can, just think about God and God will take care of all the rest. Mm -hmm. I thought that was really good. Every day, as often as you can, just think about God and God will take care of everything else. So that's the type of consciousness that we'll try to foster in ourselves and one another. Thank you. And just settle into the chair and let the chair support you. We don't have to sit all by ourselves. <laughs> we can accept that support. And as we do so, we let that be symbolic of our receptive state. Sweet, sweet spirit, we are so receptive. We are open. We want to feel your presence every moment, every day, and everything that we do. Even in the midst of our busyness, as we go about our day, we affirm and we call upon your presence to infuse everything we do, every word we say, every interaction with each person we encounter, and even when we're just talking to ourselves. Let us be at peace. Let us be gentle with ourselves. And remember your infinite love for us. We know that you love each and every one of us fellow brothers and sisters, and even those that don't feel like a fellow brother and sister, feel like an enemy. We know that you love each and every one of us. And as we claim that for others, we claim that for ourselves. And we simply remember into this, we simply relax into this state of remembering and tapping into and drawing upon this infinite well of wisdom and recognize that it's always at hand, infinite well of wisdom and guidance and direction. And it only requires us to pause ever so briefly from our busy world, just ask. And we know that spirit will come rushing in to fulfill our request, giving us all that we need in that very moment. Now I encourage you just stay in the silence for another minute or two and just take these thoughts to heart and apply them to some aspect of your life. Wherever we are, God is.